all so much for coming out tonight. My name is Christina, and I'm the events coordinator at Books Are Magic, the bookstore just a few doors down on Montague. We're really excited to be here tonight, and before we get started, I wanted to get a few housekeeping notes out of the way. I first want to thank St. Anne's for allowing us to use their space for this event. If you need to use a restroom at any point, run through the doors on my right in the far corner of that room. At the end of the talk, we'll be doing an audience Q&A via the line in the center aisle. We'll let you know once it's time to start lining up for that. I know many of you picked up a signed book with your ticket, but we'll have additional copies of Lauren's and Miranda's books available for purchase where you checked in. Lauren will be personalizing books at the end of the show. We'll let you know where and when to start lining up for that. If you're joining us on the live stream tonight, we encourage you to buy a copy of The Vast or Wild via the link in the description. All right, so tonight I'm excited to introduce Lauren Brock in conversation with Miranda July, who are here to discuss Lauren's latest novel, The Vaster Wilds. The Vaster Wilds is a taut and electrifying novel about one spirited girl alone in the wilderness, trying to survive. Lauren Brock's new novel is at once a thrilling adventure story and a penetrating fable about trying to find a new way of living in a world succumbing to the churn of colonialism. The novel is a work of raw and prophetic power that tells the story of America in miniature, through one girl at a hinge point in history to ask how and if we can adapt quickly enough to save ourselves. Lauren Brock is a three-time National Book Award finalist and New York Times bestselling author for novels Arcadia, Fates and Furies, Matrix, and more. Brock's work regularly appears in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, and elsewhere. The Vaster Wilds is her seventh novel. In conversation with Lauren is Miranda Gillette. Her most recent book is The First Batman, a novel. She wrote, directed, and starred in The Future as Me and You and Everyone We Know. Her third movie, Cajillion Mare, debuted in 2020. So without further delay, everyone please give a very warm welcome to Lauren and Miranda. Leather gloves and the thick cloak the girl had stolen off her own mistress. 
She banished the thought of the woman still weeping upon her knees on the frozen ground in the courtyard inside that hellish place. With each step she drew away, everything there loosened its grip on the ground. Yet there was a strange gleam upon the dark ground of the field ahead, and as she moved, she saw it was the undershirt of the soldier who a fortnight earlier had been caught worming his body slow from the horrors of the fort and toward the different horrors of the forest. He had made it halfway to the trees when, in silence, a shadow that had lain upon the ground grew denser, grew upward, came clear at last as the fearsomest of the men of this country, the warrior two heads taller than the men of the fort, who made himself yet more terrible by wearing upon his shoulders outstretched a broad, dark mantle of turkey feathers. He had lifted with one hand the creeping, fearful soldier by his hair, and had with a knife cut a long, wet, red mouth into the man's throat. Then he dropped him to spill his heart's blood into the frozen earth, and there the dead man lay, displayed, ignoble. All this time, he had lain unburied, for the soldiers of the settlement had become too weak and too cowardly in their hunger to fetch the body back. She had passed the dead man, and this reek had drawn itself out of her nostrils, and she was nearly to the woods when she stumbled again, for the thought of these two men gave rise to thoughts of other men who lurked perhaps in the woods men out there hidden and awaiting her. And now, as she peered before her into the dark of the forest, she saw a man crouching in ambush in ever deeper blacker shadow of each tree, perhaps a man with a knife or an ax or an arrow, and cold murder in his eye. She stopped her running for a breath, but she had no choice. She took her courage up again, and she ran on. And as she ran, each imagined man in passing revealed himself to be mere shadow.
right? Um, and so I really just read everything that was ostensibly by Shakespeare. I think Time of Athens may not have been his, just because it's not good. Um, <laughs> but, you know, everything, like the, the sonnets and everything, and you start to hear the rhythms, and you start to hear sort of the, the way that the, the thinking is happening, too. So the, the deeper, not, not just syntactical rhythms, but the, 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 the passionate sort of thought rhythms underneath right. everything. Um, and then actually, so I write, I know we're going to get to this as well, so I'll throw it out here. I write lots of drafts in longhand and throw them out and start over again. And one of the drafts, I was just so happy. Um, I knew I wasn't going to keep it because I never keep my early drafts. I, I wrote um, an entire draft in iambics, um, which was so stupid. Um, <laughs> it was, it was like, oh no, but it was so much fun. Right? It was just sheer joy to do that. Um, and it, but here's the beautiful thing about doing something like this, like imposing an artificial structure on the sentences themselves, is that I, um, I started in writing in poetry, particularly formal poetry, mm -hmm. and when you impose a superstructure upon your thoughts, your thoughts get weird really fast, right? Mm -hmm. So if you try to write a bill and L, it's going to go in very strange directions, I find. And so like actually like really tight form is really liberating. Right, it's like bondage. Like. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, okay, that makes that makes sense to me. Yeah, I realize I did jump in. Let me go back because I have more. I like these process questions. I I but let me just start like, what was the seed for this, and and kind of like what was going on in your life when that seed implanted? You know. Um, well, um, the, the very first scene of this book was, uh, I was in a doctor's office, and um, the Smithsonian Magazine was the only thing that I wanted to read. Everything else was really trashy, which I love, but um, in this particular case, I opened it up, and there was something on Jamestown during the starving time, which is 1609 to 1610, and there was a revelation in there for me, which was that um, the, uh, there were the bones dug up of a 14-year-old girl that showed evidence of cannibalism. Uh, which shocked and delighted me in equal measure. Um, and that stayed in me for years when I finally reread Robinson Crusoe, which I had first read under duress um, as a high school <laughs> student and hated. And then I read it uh, older, in um, maybe 2015. And it is one of the greatest books of all times, not because it's not problematic, it's deeply, deeply problematic, right? Um, but it's also an amazing uh, vision of the brains of the people of the time of writing, right? So, so what does Robinson Crusoe do when he gets to the island but become um, a capitalist, right? He sits there and he works really, really hard to build a table and then he enslaves the one person he comes up against, right? Like he's like a colonialist, like deep down. Um, so I think it's an amazing story and very touching and, and weird points. Um, and so I, I read that, and then I also started thinking about captivity narratives, early American captivity narratives, which is weirdly the first um, feminized, among the first feminized forms of uh, literature by American women. Um, so uh, there was poetry, of course, but uh, early American captivity narratives are these as told to narratives of the kidnapping of women on the frontier for a ransom later, and they were used as propaganda uh, for Western expansion and genocide. So they're horrific in their political use, but really, really interesting when you read them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that was the scene. Yeah. That's cool. Um, let's see. Uh, I guess because you. You touched on it. Um, could you talk about like coming at colonialism not just in the macro historical sense of this time, but also like the disruptions of small animals, bugs, grubs? Like that to me was very touching. How how it became this really. Um, book about now, you know, really, like, if you were going to write a book of, about what's happening now, this, this, uh, what we're in, this climate crisis, you would start there, 
started, we'd start with, um, yeah, like the disruption moving through nature and, and not knowing, noticing what we were changing as we moved. I, um, talk, I guess just more about that, that was so incredible. I, yeah, I, um, I'm only speaking for myself, right, because I, I do not hold uh, dictates for other artists, but I, I, for myself, if I don't talk about the climate crisis, then what am I doing, right? Because it, it, it eats at my life and my anxiety, and it's just one of those things that I have to talk about in every book. Even the books that you think are not going to be about it end up being about it. Um, and, you know, I do think it's um, it's maybe a, a, a duty I've taken on myself, a moral duty, um, to try to find a way to, to loop history into what we're going through now. Um, in order to do multiple things, I think one is um, humans and nature are both deeply resilient, and the story now is one of incredible passion. Um, and uh, almost like feeling like we can do nothing for the climate crisis when really nature just wants to live, right? And all we have to do is help it. That's it. That's all we have to do. And so, so deepening the historical understanding of the, the Anthropocene feels like an urgent task for um, someone invested in storytelling and narrative right now, right? And, but another thing too is understanding that um, wherever humans are, there's climate you know, it's, it's, it's understanding that it, you make a fire in the woods, you're changing the, the deep, um, uh, I guess the soul of the woods themselves. Right now, like that log that you used is not going to um, decay and provide food for the grouts and woodstools, right? So, so even small changes are large changes. And so we have to understand this and, and understand that we're a, one thread in a far greater warp and weave of the planets, and that um, everything we do sort of changes the environment, and we can minimize that by understanding that we're not standing separate from, but that we are part of nature. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, so, yes, so this is, this is my theory of historical fiction, which is that it is a way to, one, one of the ways that we can talk about things that people may not want to talk because you can, you can talk about these things at a slant, right? You can slide your way into them and then end up, you know, discussing, um, you know, misogyny in the church in 11, um, you know, 59, but we're really talking about misogyny now. Uh, it's just a way of sort of sneakily, like, um, discussing the urgencies of it now. Yeah, are you, this, I mean, as we're talking about this, because no one, read this book? No, right? Because it just came out. <laughs> yeah. okay. um, uh, um, it's rare, it's so rare that I read something other people have uh, like, amazing. Uh, I mean, I can picture, no, because you're all, you know her work and, and how gripping it always is, but me being sometimes kind of dumb and wanting like an easy thing might, if I, everything she just said, be like, I don't know, will it be a thrilling page turner? You know, <laughs> it is. Um, and part of that is, be, I, I will just say, I was in, I started reading this on a flight to Milan that was a quick, you know, really important trip. And I'd be in meetings, like really crucial meetings, thinking my book is in the hotel room as soon as I get back there and start reading it. Uh -huh. like, <laughs> so it's that kind of book, you know, where you just have a warm feeling because it's waiting, you know? Oh. Um, and some of that is because, uh, I'll just say it, like you're the same reason we like to watch Survivor, um, or any of those um, movies, or like Castaway or The Martian, or these things, I, I love those movies, um, is part of the grippiness, and it's, it's so brilliant, I mean, sort of for what you're saying, saying also, like talking in a slant, that like it, it, um, it just works really well. So I guess maybe talk about that, like are you interested in those shows? Okay. <laughs> um, and then also 
maybe a little about research, like, could I really survive living in a tree like that? <laughs> um, should I use this as a manual? Um. <laughs> so, so during the pandemic, my husband got deeply into this YouTube channel called Primitive Survival, um, where it's just a guy who goes out into the woods, like, I think he's naked, um, and he has like a machete, and he, with the machete, he builds some sort of structure. And it was just transfixing. It was just the thing that he would watch at night. That or, and, and now I'm telling him, this poor man is not here to defend himself, but um, train trips through snowy Lake Siberia. He also watched that too. But so with the, the thing about, I really love survival stories. Right? I've always loved survival stories. I think it's because my anxiety is keyed up to 11, which is a very anxious person. And there is a narrative function for this sort of storytelling. Um, Bruno Lettelheim, who is the, who studied fairy tales among other things, would say that fairy tales act as, as a kind of inoculation against the anxieties of the children who would be listening to them at the fireplace at the time. So, right, so, so the worst possible thing that could happen to you as a child in, say, 1340 was there's a famine, and your parents decide they'd rather have you starve to death than them, and so they lead you out into the woods um, with nothing in your pocket but a bunch of crumbs. Like, it's incredible. So it's, it's a vaccine against the sort of the worst thing that could possibly happen. And when you live it um, within the enclosed, very controlled space of storytelling, you feel as though you've had that experience, and you know that you can make it all the way through. Right? So it's, it's the same idea with um, these survival stories for me, which I am transfixed by and love. Right? When, I don't have a TV at home, but when I, when I go to a hotel, it's always like naked and afraid. Uh, right? It's like all night long, it's all I want to see is just like people out in the wilderness losing 40% of their body fat. <laughs> 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 Hunting fish with their bare hands is so delightful. <laughs> okay, I'm going to ask uh, another process question just because I don't want to run out of time. So the thing that, this was how, like, this was one of these books to finish. Like, here's me reading the last page. How did you know 
that you are going to do it like that. Um, uh, we know what we're talking about, right? Because we do. We whisper <laughs> some things and you're lost. They can't know, but yeah. yeah. Um, uh, well, with this book, uh, the, there's, there's always, for, for my books, there's an overt structure and there's a hidden structure. Okay. And, um, the overt structure is really simple, right? It's a woman running through the woods, right? So it's, <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, no. escaping things. Um, but the hidden structure is a, a chiasmic, or so um, the Greek letter chi is in the shape of an X. Okay. Um, and so through the book, there's a disintegration physically in the material world, right? Mm -hmm. But there's an anagogical lift at the same time, so toward God. Um, or towards spirituality, and it had to happen this way. This book couldn't unroll in any other way because I was, uh, uh, I don't, it's very hard to talk around what we're talking about. I know, I know, <laughs> this is so unfair. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to know this, and afterwards she's gonna sign books, and I'm not gonna. Yeah, um. so it's, um, there's <laughs> one, yes. Also, I have to say that that was one of like, the best review I've ever had. Thank you very much for it, um, I see you. I see my soul. Thank you. Um, well, I don't read my reviews, but you just spoke it to me, so thank you very much. Yeah, so it was, yeah, it's, structure is so profoundly important uh, for me from about halfway through the drafting process. It's something that, um, makes the book become what it is. Uh, and I have to actually keep my brain from imposing a structure until I understand a glimmer of what I think the book is going to be. And then generally, the, the middle to the end um, drafts are really messing up and, and choosing the wrong structure and, and, and understanding why it gets wrong and bad. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, there can be a lot of, like, one anxiously wants a structure to hold them, yes. you know. Yes. So. Yes. And sometimes it takes 10 years to find that, that form, right? Wow. So sometimes it takes a really yeah. long time. But you have to be patient, because you can't close it on yeah. the you can't yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe that leads into, so like I know from the acknowledgments of Matrix that you were writing that during the pandemic, I mean, and when it came out and stuff, but but then in this one, you also must have written. <laughs> so I know you work on multiple things at the same time, but maybe you could just talk about at least those two books. I don't know what else you were working on, but how that all works. So in 2019, poor um, Bill and Sarah, my agent and editor, got this like dump of three books that I just like threw in their laps, and I was like, here you go. Um, and uh, they were faster in Matrix, and this third book that I'm, it's actually actively like sapping my blood at night, like a succubus. Um, it's, like, it's actually like I cannot write this thing. Um, but it's fine, uh, I guess. Uh, but they all stand alone, right? They're, they're separate, deeply different books, even stylistically. Everything is very different in them. But they're, they're obsessed with um, a lot of similar. So it's, I, I like to see it as a triptych, as opposed to a trilogy, obviously. But they're, they're circling around, you know, climate change, um, women, the, the deep harm that religion has done to people and the planet. Um, not God, but religion, mm -hmm. right, which is a deeply separate thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all of these things are sort of seeing the same lower register that I'm trying to keep underneath the surface that other people won't be able to hear. So, yeah. But they, they do, they interdigitate in ways that are, um, that if one were to study them, you know, you would figure it out for sure. But I don't want people to study them, unless you're in a PhD, in which case go for it. Yeah, I mean, just to like check in with everyone and myself, that what she just said, like delivering three, you know, like, and how they, or to like that's not normal. <laughs> <laughs> and then and like she doesn't mean three bad <laughs> which would still be amazing. Like she's like you know look up, look around and just realize like oh this is like a major working in our time. 
that were among. I just think it's it's special at like <laughs> um, there's so many things happening and we're online and we're scrolling through our phones and like it's just like that you know there's a lot of people making cool things but we were here with this person <laughs> who's working so hard and thinking so hard and in a really like special way that there will never be another one of her you know so um, or a baby, I'll have to say. Thank you, Rosie. I was getting too deep. But, but yeah, just like, um, yeah, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, you hear about like these major figures, like Greek, you know, just like this is, oh, you know, no. well, you know, at the time they were going, <laughs> <laughs>
And do you, I'm just trying to figure out how physically, oh, like we've already yeah. established, you know, what, we've got a lot going on up here, but like, how do you, um, <laughs> like when do you move in the day? Yeah, so I get up super, super early, mm -hmm. um, I drink a cup of coffee or like a pot, um, and um, I write long hands because right. it's good. I don't know if you write long hands. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, but it's, it's amazing because it's sensory, right? Yeah. You can smell the paper, you can smell the, the ink, and you can see, like, the, the you can see the pores. I mean, some of us. I couldn't find a printer. So I, <laughs> I love it. I like, I like your handwriting. It's very pretty. Um, and, right, you, so it, and you're sort of, hun you're not hunched over, but you're, you're face to face with your work in a different way. It slows you down in thinking, it slows down your writing. I can't read my own writing, so um, it becomes separate from meaning, and I'm just sort of building meaning in my head as opposed to on the page, which is also very beautiful. Um, and, then, um, and then I get up and I go, like, run to think. Uh, or to, to not think and let the subconscious do its work and then come back and fix a lot of the problems and over and over again. Uh, yeah, it is, it's a deeply physical thing, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, yeah it's funny. I, someone was telling me some like fortune thing recently where you write something down or mantra or something like that. And, and she kept saying, but you can't write it on your phone. You can't type it. You have to write it on paper or it won't happen. Um, and I was like, oh, right. Maybe that's why you do that. Yeah. Oh, no, yeah. I like that. No. Yeah. yeah. No, it's really because I have OCD. And if I were to write everything on a computer, I oh, would change yeah. everything. Um, uh, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Oh, really? Just one more? Okay. Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, okay. Okay. Well, this is. Um, oh, I don't know if that was going to go well. How about the question is just me doing this? Um, uh, okay. Well, um, so, you know, when you said that this was like on Twitter or something, but it. You called everyone you met upside down and shaped the mighty ankles to get every last detail you can steal from them. Um, I uh, I made something recently that was quite close to the bone, and I keep quoting. I go, well, as people are a little upset if they see themselves in it, I keep going, well, Lori Roth calls everyone up by the ankles, and no one, no one's reassured by that. Right? Um, yeah. Yeah, and so I guess. I mean, so I'm reading this, and I'm like, oh, well, she's in the clear here in the 1600s. I should be setting things then. Um, Calm <laughs> down. Um, uh, but I guess, nonetheless, I read this, and I know that there's things in here. So could you just leave us maybe with one anecdote, one thing that is shaken out of your or someone else's pockets? Yeah. That's in the six, I mean, it's, that's hidden. I don't know if that makes yeah. sense as a question. That's a great, yes. Um, well, I mean, just in kind of broad terms, this book feels like a transcription of what I really believe about the, the world. And I know this is not a thing. I'm no, sorry. no, I get what you're, you're going in this was, I should have asked that question, so you answered it. Yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, this is this is what I think about God, right? This is what I think about other human beings, right? And I think sometimes um, in my past books, I let um, my fear overtake that candor, um, and I maybe fear that people wouldn't like my soul. Mm -hmm. on the page. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So I've we'll we'll never. Be Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so I would, I guess. Vegetarian, I don't know, would you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, are we doing questions? Yes, today? that's what we're doing. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, we didn't say no. that. Um, now, um, look within yourself and <laughs> ask a, a question that's something you really want to know. And, um, and
Feel free to be the first person. You can also ask Miranda. You know, or not. <laughs> we'll have other times. Um, this is, yeah. The first one um, who asks the question wins. <laughs> I'll tell you what later. Oh, okay. Oh, well, good job. Like, you are so brave. So far, she just comes to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here she comes. She's running down. Look at you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you win. What do I win? And we were stuck in Stuart, Florida uh, for a little while, right before the pandemic and during the pandemic. Can you tell me, we got a little crazy, but does the geography, the topography affect what you're writing? Because it definitely affected when we were there and when I was writing. So, yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Right? I mean, Florida is the strangest place. And it's, um, it's full of uh, contradictions and great beauty and horrific politicians. Um, and you know, it's, it's, I think it's good never to feel 100% at home if you're a writer. I think you should always feel a little bit uncomfortable and sad. Uh, so Florida does that for me. It really makes me very sad. <laughs> and uncomfortable, because I hate heat. I actually cannot, I hate sweating. I hate it, right? And like, there is no time. There's January when you go to sweat. Uh, for two, right? I'm so sorry for you. I'm so <laughs> no, but and yet at the same time, there's there's exquisite beauty. There are these these um, springs that come up, burble up from the aquifer. They're 70 degrees, so they're too cold for alligators. Well, they're little alligators, not big ones. Um, and they um, and you can float down them for four hours, and then float through the jungle and sort of like watch the birds swing overhead. Right? And it's the most exquisite, ecstatic experience as you're in this cold place in this hot environment. Right? So there are wonderful things. It's just um, great. So not great sometimes, right? I'm, anyway, uh, are you going back? You know, no. Yeah. Because um, our in laws left. We were stuck there for a little while. We had to live with them. But um, it was inspired the title for your short story collection. Okay. So it's like, I, I love that it was somewhere like. You think, oh, New York City so inspirational, there's so many things happening. But like being stuck somewhere that I didn't have any friends, anybody my age, no offense to other people. Oh, yeah. But I couldn't make any friends because I was like, you know, this is a very small town, but it was super inspired, you know, by writing that point. That's the most fertile I felt. See, so Laura Vandenberg has this amazing book coming out next year called Florida Diary, and it's I think it's Stuart. I think it's the same place, and it's it's it sort of it was inspired by being stuck in the pandemic um, in this strange, strange place where her husband Paul Yoon. Well, it, this is like a, it's a character, but uh, the the Paul Yoon character um, runs ten miles a day because there's nothing else to do, right? Yeah, it, it's it's an amazing book. Uh, we all love it. <laughs> yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for your bravery. You. <laughs> Good question. Yeah, please just uh, like head on. Up. Hello. Hi. I was just wondering, how do you feel as a writer writing stories that you, you know, publish and they're fixed at that point in time? And is that something you think about? And do you look back at any earlier work and think you would have gone in a different direction now? Yes. Um, there's a there's a strange um, bittersweetness to Pub Day, which is today, right? Um, where something that's so deeply yours suddenly is no longer yours, right? And um, I, it's, it's um, a little devastating, right? Because it, it is so profoundly separated from you, from me. This is how I feel. And now it's in the hands of the readers who, who bring to the book 50% of what the book is, right? Or, or the story 50%. Um, they, the reader finishes a book. It doesn't exist until you read it. Um, so it dies a little bit on pub day, um, and is born at the same time. Uh, both can be true, and both can be deeply emotionally um, beautiful and devastating at the same time. Uh, I do. I would love to rewrite a, a few things. 
Um, I'll tell you about those later. Um, I, I love the person who wrote them. Um, and that person is necessarily a flawed person. And I can see all those flaws in vivid detail, right? I, I can just see them. Um, so they're documents of a time and a, and a place that um, I, I would definitely do better if I were to do it now. Thank you. Um, but that said, you, know, you have to let your projects live on their own. What do you think? This is a good question for you. Yeah. Yeah, I think you just said it. I, was, I think the flaws, because there's always going to be some people who are currently flawed the way you were then, and that book can be for them, you know, like, and if you made it you now, they might not even like it. Yeah. You know, I don't know, there's something about that. Do you, do you love all of your past work? I, no. <laughs> I mean, I don't really look at it, um, but occasionally, like, you know, so you'll be forced, it'll somehow come up and it's like, um, kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah. But it's nice in the abstract when people are like, oh, I liked this, this, and I'm like, <laughs> the titles, you get really familiar with the titles. <laughs> that's true. <good. laughs> and you forget the work itself. Yeah, yeah that's true. Like, yeah. 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 I love that. When people ask you a very detailed question about something like 15 years ago, you're like, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Someone else wrote that book. Yeah. Yeah, come on up. What, if you have a question, just come up. We're informal. We're all friends. Okay, um, so Lauren, you mentioned writing full-length drafts and then tossing them out as part of your creative process. I'm wondering um, what your, how you feel when you feel that it's ready to be handed in. Uh, you mentioned handing in three books at once. Mm -hmm. um, so is it positive, negative, kind of calm? I mean, what's that? What's that? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's frustrated, right? Because I generally, except for this this last of the, um, I generally don't give anything to anyone unless I think that it's close to being done, and I really just need someone else to to tell me where it's deeply, profoundly, like horrible and flawed, right? But I think like it's it's come as close as I can bring it to the platonic ideal. And then other people shake it up and make it better. Um, so generally, it's it's with a sense of kind of relief, you know, to get this book off of me that I've been living in, or it's been living in me, or I, like we've been living in each other um, for so long. And you you hand it over to someone else to tell you what they see. And a lot of times, what they see is not what you think they're going to see, which is also kind of terrifying. As well. Do you um, then maybe talk about your relationship with your editor? I, I love my editor. So, <laughs> I also love my agent book bag. So Bill actually sees most things before Sarah does, just because he has a different eye. Um, and we've been together for, like, he's, he's like my, he's my husband in, in work. Um, he, he sees things, he sees things first. Um, and, he, and if they're really bad, he will not let me give them to Sarah. So that's wonderful. Um, yeah, Sarah's, you know, Sarah is magnificent. I have to, can I, say, I have to sing Sarah's praise. Um, when I sold her Fates and Furies, she sent me 20 single space pages of the most amazing ideas and like large scale sort of like operatic changes that also affected small scale changes. She's so good at what she does. So I trust her deeply, deeply on every level. Thank you. Thank you. One more question. That's you. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, you're good. You're good. It's fine. <laughs> I have a really small question too. It's not a big round question. But I was really curious about the long hand drafts. And we said you can't read your own handwriting. Um, and so I'm just really curious how it turned into. Like literally, like as a twenty book, like yeah. you type it up. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, Bill, Bill doesn't person. do it <laughs> <laughs> because I, I mean, it's just so interesting. Yeah. And I also write a lot long and I can't read my handwriting. But so eventually, do you make the switch or do you? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, but okay. So I read this a long time ago. I read this wonderful Diane Middlebrook um, biography of Anne Sexton 
where uh, there is this passage where Anne Sexton, at a certain point, was taking so much lithium that she, like, she, when she was writing, like, she, her hand was shaking so much that she couldn't really re read her own handwriting. And there's this moment where she was writing a poem that has the line, um, rowing toward God, but it's only rowing toward God because she had originally written running. Um, and I love that, right? That's like a place where um, my, when I'm trying to transcribe from what I finally think is something close to a draft that I can put on the computer, uh, and I can't read my own handwriting, there's this glorious um, window broken open in the text where what I'm reading is not actually what I wrote. And so you have this dual voice happening in your head where you're like, well, it could be this terrible thing, but it could also be this brand new strange, you know, metaphor that came out of nowhere, but I kind of love it, you know? So it's a way of um, throwing a little chaos back into something that you're trying really hard at that point not to be too tightly closed, right? To, or too um, hermetically sealed. It's really fun, and the whole process is really fun. I mean, there are times when I lie in a bathtub and cry, but, um, you know, if it, it, I don't know about you, but if, if, a, if a work is, um, it's alive in you, all you want to do is just sort of spend time with it, right? And, and make it come to um, the best possible point it can be. It's just joy. All right. So that's it, right? Yes. All right. Well, thank you, guys. Yeah. Thank you for, for this special day together. The first one, she'll go many, many places, but she was with us first. Um, and now you get to read the book. All right. Um, and she'll be, he'll be out there, so I'm yes. yes. Thank you, Brandon. Yes. yes. You are amazing. Thank you. Yes. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you again, Lauren and Miranda, for a wonderful conversation. Please give Lauren a moment to get settled, and we'll begin the signing line through the door to my right. Then down, back up to my aisle. If you'd like to pick up an additional copy, they're available for sale near where you check. Thanks again and have a great night.